Chi, who's a director of research at the National Iranian American Council. Reza, thanks ever so much for being with us. Um, how likely are these new talks to succeed, in your opinion, first of all? We've kind of been here before, but is something different about them this time round? I think you're right to note that we have been here before, but there is uh, probably two things that are very different. One, we haven't seen the situation between Iran and the international community be at such a fevered pitch. We've never been so close to the precipice of war as we are now. And I think that's focused the attention of decision makers, not only in Washington and Tehran, but throughout the international community on, on investing in a process of sustained negotiations and, and, and letting all parties know they need to compromise rather than exchanging ultimatums. So uh, we have a few weeks before the talks commence and it's going to be a lot of backroom politicking, trying to figure out how we can find constructive solutions towards peace and, and hopefully all parties involved, including the Israelis, but not limited to, will we'll invest in that process rather than more destructive processes that can uh, throw the talks off and, and cause them to not be successful. Well, you mentioned Israel there. For now, it seems to have accepted these talks as a solution, but only with the promise that the U.S. will use force if all else fails. Is there anything that can make Tel Aviv back down from a military solution? I think uh, unequivocal statements from the President of the United States, some of which we've seen over the last 48 to 72 hours, is really the only thing that can cause the Israeli government to fall back and, and not issue uh, threats of military action. Uh, you know, the Israeli population has been recently polled and, and uh, uh, close to 60 percent are not in favor of a military strike on Iran if the United States is not supportive or it's not done with the United States. And that's significant leverage for Barack Obama. And, and perhaps that's one of many reasons why he's come out uh, in recent days and pushed back against the voices calling for war, not only uh, amongst Israelis, but also within his own Congress. We're hearing that experts uh, within the IEA are saying uh, intelligence is suggesting that Iran is is cleaning up traces of nuke building at that Parchin plant before letting the inspectors in. How credible can that intelligence be, do you think? Well, so far there have been reports that have been leaked by unnamed diplomatic sources. And, you know, is it a cause for concern? No doubt. But it was a cause for concern before these leaked reports hit the newspapers. I, I think more importantly, we need to, A, confirm these reports, and B, focus on how to get Iran to come clean and, and prevent uh, any future conflict from, from moving forward in the future. And the best way to do that is to in, engage in a diplomatic process that lets the Iranians know two things. One, they won't be punished for sins previously committed, otherwise they have no reason to come clean. And, and two, uh, let the Iranians know that this must be discussed, but it can be discussed on the back end after the more pressing concerns and the more pressing issues that have caused us to get to the precipice of war are resolved. Yeah, Reza, uh, while all this is going on, it's such a big melting pot, isn't it? Neighboring Syria seems to be Iran's only regional partner. Now, with Damascus facing harsh international pressure. Is that in turn going to add the pressure, redouble it onto Tehran as well? Well, I think, uh, you know, Iran doesn't have a lot of friends or really any friends in the international community. It has business relationships and one of its strongest is Syria. And, uh, you know, to the degree that Syria remains unstable and a political solution is not found, then, you know, this is going to turn into a geopolitical battle that's uh, going to be used for leverage, both by Iran and the international community, because they're not exactly on the same page when it comes to the Syria issue. So uh, it can be a cause for, for further destabilization on other issues relating to Iran, including the nuclear program. But uh, until both sides realize that a political solution is necessary and, you know, uh, further militarizing the situation in Syria is actually in nobody's interest. Interest. Mm. I don't think we're going to reach any kind of solution in, in the interim. And there seem to be big signals from uh, President Obama when it comes to Syria. It's turned out that, that he asked the Pentagon to evaluate military options towards the crisis. Now, how does that fit in then with his earlier statement that any unilateral military action on Syria would be a mistake? They don't kind of tie in, do they? Sure, it's a great question. I think it's a bit of political posturing from the president. Uh, we literally here in the United States have uh, military plans for almost any scenario that you can conceive of. So him s saying that he's asked the military to draw up those plans is it, it, something that's already been done, and it's something that's continuously revised, not just on Syria, but a host of issues that are facing the uh, United States and its security concerns. So more politicking than anything. Uh, and, you know, just like our generals and our intelligence officials have come out and recently said at the podium very publicly, uh, the likelihood of a military solution to this conflict is very low. Uh, and that's why they're trying to figure out what's the, what's the plausible political solution to stop the killing, stop the violence on all sides. Certainly so, uh, a lot of second thoughts maybe about imposing a no-fly zone over Syria. U.S. Defense Secretary uh, Leon Panetta acknowledging that the Syrian army is far more capable than Libya's was. We saw the no-fly zone imposed over Libya, uh, and that it would be much more of a challenge. Why is that the case? Uh, is it because Syria is far more advanced when it comes to that kind of thing? And if that is the case, what other military alternatives 
might America consider in Syria? I think I think it's more difficult in Syria for two reasons. One, you know, Syria has uh, biological and chemical weapons, the extent of which is not entirely clear, but it's known that they have them. And there's a serious concern that uh, further destabilizing the situation could lead to uh, the kind of situation where those things might be factored into play. And that's not a risk that the international community, particularly the United States, really wants to engage upon, at least not now. And, uh, you know, the other thing that's probably a paramount concern to the United States is there's no guarantee that uh, a military option will provide a military solution. There really is no military solution to this. So they're trying to avoid it at all costs because it's just going to cause the international community to get bogged down. Uh, a no-fly zone isn't a solution. It's an interim step to try to utilize leverage vis-a-vis -vis the Assad regime. So I think the Obama administration is smart in, in focusing on the political solution over the military solution, at least right now. Reza, thanks for taking the time to be with us. Reza Marashi, their director of research at the National Iranian American Council, joining us from Washington, D.C. Thank you. Head to our website, rt.com.